I hope it's not a controversial statement to suggest that while the war in Ukraine is mostly being fought between Ukraine and the Russian Federation, countries around the world have been actively focused on the conflict and many of them have been providing active assistance to the various combatants. We've talked a lot, and perhaps rightly so, about Ukraine's many allies and the important role they've played. After all, the sort of support Ukraine has received has been frankly immense. Billions of dollars in advanced weapons, millions of refugees taken in overseas, and immense economic pressure leveraged against the Russian Federation. Without the constant flow of money and material support, it's difficult to imagine how Ukraine would be in the position that it is now. So far as tokens and expression of friendship go, deliveries of HIMARS, rockets, and reconnaissance data probably ranks pretty highly, at least in Ukraine's eyes. Less frequently talked about, however, are Russia's allies, its friends, and the roles that they are playing with the war in Ukraine. Because as much as it's a tempting media narrative to portray Russia as a completely isolated pariah state, it still in the end has some allies. It's the member of its own version of the NATO alliance, the CSTO, and it has a number of bilateral security arrangements with other countries. And occasionally those countries find an opportunity to show their true colours. In early October, for example, the UN General Assembly held a vote on whether or not to condemn Russia's claims to annex four regions of Ukraine. These included both Donetsk and Lugansk, but also Zaporizhia and Kherson. Now, some people did find that particularly odd, considering that at the time the Russians claimed to annex all those provinces, they didn't actually control the entire territories of Donetsk or Zaporizhia or Kherson. In any case, while a General Assembly resolution doesn't have the same binding power and enforceability as a Security Council resolution, it does have moral value. And so it's notable to see which nations voted in favour. 143 nations voted that day to condemn Russia's purported annexation. Five nations voted against. The names probably aren't any surprise. It was Russia itself, Belarus, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the Syrian Arab Republic, and Nicaragua, all nations that were proudly willing to stand up in front of their fellow nations in the United Nations General Assembly and declare they didn't really think there was anything wrong with sending your army into a neighbouring country and grabbing bits of its territory. Now, while that vote was only symbolic, it does seem to demonstrate that Russia still had at least some friends, even if they're not exactly global superpowers. Some of those nations have been willing to convert whatever feelings they have of camaraderie and allegiance into concrete steps to assist the Russian military in Ukraine. Now, these responses have varied massively, all the way from contributing basically nothing, in the case of Nicaragua, all the way up to supplying shipments of artillery shells, drones, and missiles, in the case of Belarus and Iran. Iran even being a bit of a special case because it wasn't present at the UN vote, but very happy to make it up to Moscow by sending them bunches of weapons. And so today, I thought it was worth looking at some of Russia's friends and allies in detail. What is the background to their relationship? What are their capabilities? And what are they contributing to the war in Ukraine? So what am I going to be talking about in detail? The first thing I'm going to talk about is Russia's, what is often called Russia's NATO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the CSTO. I'm going to look at what nations are members, how it was founded, what its capabilities are, how it's structured, and why it's basically been a no-show in Ukraine. Then I'm going to flip over to looking at three countries that have made some sort of contribution. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Syria, and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Then I'm going to close out by giving an overall evaluation. What is the impact of these friendly nations to Russia been? What is the potential for them to increase or decrease their support moving forward? And what should we expect next? One country you've probably noticed isn't on my list to discuss today is the People's Republic of China, and I just wanted to take a moment to explain why. Compared to the other nations that I'm going to discuss today, China has truly immense economic and military resources. It's a giant in international affairs with significant global reach. And in my view, that means any episode discussing China should probably focus on, well, China. But while I would like to discuss China and Russia's so-called partnership without limits in the future, because it really is an interesting artifact of global affairs, I don't think classifying China as an ally in the context of the Ukraine war is appropriate for this episode. China hasn't recognized Russia's claimed annexations of Ukrainian territory, it's abstained on the relevant United Nations votes, and it hasn't been involved, as far as we can tell, in providing weapons or military assistance to the Russians. While it's no doubt had a very significant impact on how the global economy has handled the war in Ukraine, I don't believe the People's Republic of China belongs in a video discussing countries that have offered to send things like weapons or volunteers to support the Russian war effort. Nor does China have any sort of formal military alliance with Russia that would compel it to do so. 
So instead, let's talk about some countries that might. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is basically Russia's NATO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization. And if you did a little bit of a double take when I said Russia's NATO, you're probably not alone. This is not an organization that gets a lot of airtime or is talked about particularly often in Western media. But for many of the member states, the CSTO and its security guarantees are very, very real. The reliance they placed on it is very, very real. And its impact and occasional lack of impact in that part of the world is worth noting. The CSTO is essentially a security agreement that was founded between a number of the members, but not all of the members that were part of the Commonwealth of Independent States. The CIS, and no, not the one from Star Wars, was founded in the dying days of the Soviet Union. Essentially, it was an agreement between many of the, at this point, soon to be ex-Soviet republics, who agreed that they wanted to be independent states, but also kind of wanted to continue to have really tight relations with each other. And if you're having trouble visualising just what the CIS looks like, there's a map which sets it out, at least with its current membership. And if you're looking at that and saying, hey, that looks like the Soviet Union, but without the bits that really don't like Russia, namely Ukraine and the Baltic states, well, then you're pretty close to on the money. The Baltic states were too busy celebrating independence to have anything to do with what was left of the Soviet Union. The Ukrainians, well, they ratified the creation agreement for the CIS, but not the actual charter, so were never full members. And Georgia had already left the CSTO in 1999, which I guess relieved Russia of the embarrassment of having to invade a member of its own military alliance. But all told, that still leaves nine current members. Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. But only six of those nations are members of the CSTO. Those six signatories obviously include Russia and Belarus, the so-called Union State, but also Armenia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And signing up to the CSTO means signing up to an awful lot more, in a military sense, than just being a member of the CIS. There are joint exercises, there's a joint command structure, we'll look at both of those to a limited extent in a moment, but importantly there is Article 4. This is the CIS version of NATO's Article 5, the attack on one is an attack on all provision. And I wanted to bring the text to the forefront here because you could argue that the text of Article 4 of the CSTO Treaty is actually more muscular than what appears in the NATO documents. It says roughly that if one of the state parties to the agreement is subjected to aggression by any state or group of states, then it will be considered an act of aggression against all states which are parties to the treaty. So far, so good in line with the NATO documentation. In the event of an act of aggression against any of the participating states, all other participating states will provide them, not may provide, will provide them with the necessary assistance, including military assistance, and will also provide support at their disposal in exercising the right of collective defence in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter. That doesn't leave much room for manoeuvre. The statement that you will provide the necessary assistance, including military assistance, is pretty clear cut. Although the reference to the principles of collective defence from the UN Charter make it pretty clear that this is meant to be a defensive arrangement, not an offensive one. You don't get to invoke the right of self-defence if you go and invade someone else's country and they have the temerity to shoot back. And as I hinted earlier, the CSTO has some of the trappings that you would associate of another military alliance like NATO. It has its own military staff, a chief of staff, a rotating presidency, and it holds collective exercises on an annual basis. Now, these exercises aren't always huge, but they do often number in the thousands and bring together membership from across the CSTO. The CSTO also on paper has its own rapid reaction force with the joint staff, made up of units from most but not all the member nations. Uzbekistan never agreed to participate. Although it's worth noting at this point that some of the Russian units that helped make up this collective rapid reaction force, including 98th Guards Airborne and 31st Guards Air Assault Brigade, have been very active in Ukraine and taken some pretty significant losses. I believe the 31st was at Hostomel and lost their brigade commander, and then after the retreat were redeployed and participated in the battles for Izium and Sierodonetsk. So it's an open question as to what the Russian components of the Collective Rapid Reaction Force look like at this moment. But the point is that the CSTO is, on paper, structured like a military alliance. They have joint exercises, they have a joint staff, they have the facilities and structures in place to enable things like joint peacekeeping missions. So if that's the case, why haven't we heard more about the CSTO in the context of the war in Ukraine? You know, besides the whole, it must be a defensive war thing. 
And there's probably three answers to that question. The first is, as I said, it's hard to paint Ukraine as a defensive operation that would allow Russia to invoke Article 4. The second reason is even if Russia wanted to try that on for size, it hasn't chosen to actually invoke the article. Russia hasn't used the CSTO to ask for help. But the third reason is because the CSTO, you could argue, is going through a little bit of a crisis of identity and internal confidence. This wasn't always the case. Indeed, it wasn't even the case early in 2022, because in January of this year, the government of Kazakhstan asked for support from the CSTO to put down what it described as a terrorist threat. In answer to President Tokayev's request, the CSTO sent about 2,500 troops into Kazakhstan. This short, sharp deployment between the 5th and the 11th of January when the withdrawal began did a lot to shore up the government of Kazakhstan against internal unrest, and was enough for some commentators to suggest that maybe the CSTO was being revitalised, that it had a new lease on life and a new sense of credibility among its members. Then Azerbaijan and Armenia got involved in a bit of a tussle, and Armenia this time turned to the CSTO again and asked for help. In response to renewed fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan, Armenia, a CSTO member, would claim to invoke Article 4 on the 13th of September of this year. And the CSTO's response was to slowly put together a fact-finding and monitoring mission. There was no military response. The chief of staff of the CSTO basically said that the CSTO wasn't discussing military involvement in the crisis, wouldn't discuss it tomorrow, and wouldn't, he believed, discuss it any time in the near future. Armenia would be left to fend more or less for itself. Now, whatever your stance on that particular conflict, it's clear that Armenia felt that its position had been betrayed. There have been protests in Armenia calling for withdrawal from the organisation, and general faith in the ability of the CSTO to respond to threats to its members has greatly diminished. At the point where you have Armenian government figures coming out and openly saying that they don't really see any future for the organisation, and welcoming visits by the Speaker of the House in the US, Nancy Pelosi, then you kind of know your alliance, or at least part of it, may be on borrowed time. And so, broadly speaking, I'd suggest that Russia's version of NATO is in the same situation that they were hoping they could push NATO into. Fractured, largely militarily ineffectual, and unlikely to get involved in Ukraine. In other words, don't expect the CSTO to be making any headlines. But if you're after a nation that always creates headlines, well then look no further than the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. That is, for the avoidance of all doubt, the Northern One. That's an important clarification to make, because while North Korea flirts with Russia, South Korea, the Republic of Korea, is extremely busy selling new tanks and rocket launchers to the Poles and other European states, seemingly by the division's worth. Expect a video on that particular buying spree and the K2PL sometime in the future. But the relationship between the DPRK and Russia, or at the time the Soviet Union, really does go all the way back to North Korea's founding. Soviet sponsorship and advocacy was critical to North Korea being founded as a state at the end of World War II, and was critical to the Kim family's rise to power. During the Korean War, while the Soviet Union didn't commit entire armies in the scale that the People's Republic of China did, it was a major supplier of military and material aid to the Koreans, going so far as to send Soviet pilots to fly Korean MiGs against United Nations forces. Now, the involvement of those pilots wasn't publicly disclosed at the time, but UN forces did find it very strange that sometimes you would encounter very well-piloted MiG-15s, the pilots of which, when placed under stress, would drop speaking Korean and instead start swearing in Russian. And Soviet DPRK relations would continue and indeed strengthen after the hot war phase of the Korean War was long over. The Sino-Soviet split, for example, would push the Soviet Union to intensify its aid to Korea, trying to hedge it against Chinese influence. That assistance was absolutely pivotal to North Korea's industrial development. Technical assistance, machine tools, and direct financial aid were critical to the industrialization and development of that country. And indeed, through parts of the Cold War, North Korea was actually the more prosperous of the two Korean states, despite the immense damage done by United Nations bombers during the Korean War. That perhaps gives some context as to why the collapse of the Soviet Union was such an utter calamity for Pyongyang. Suddenly, it had lost a major military ally and a major economic sponsor. Instead, during the Yeltsin era, Russia actually looked towards South Korea as a potential future ally. The 90s were a strange time. And at that point, remember, there were many that thought Russia would become a close friend of the West. 
Once Putin rose into power, they steadily began to re-improve relationships with North Korea. But it would be wrong to describe the friendship as absolute or unconditional. Russia has, for example, historically supported international sanctions against North Korea for its nuclear weapons and missile programs. It has voted in favour of restrictions on Korean arms exports, something that will become all the more ironic in a moment. But when push comes to shove, North Korea has usually been willing to back Russia, and it was one of the few nations that publicly recognised Russian claimed annexations in Ukraine, of Crimea, of Donetsk and Lugansk, of Zaporizhia and Kherson. And so given that very public sign of support, the question might be asked, what does North Korea have on hand that they might be able to provide to Russia in order to assist them? Because in defence policy, while it's always nice to offer thoughts and prayers, people would usually rather you provide troops, hardware and cash. Now, fortunately for Vladimir Putin, and unfortunately for everyone who lives in North Korea, the DPRK has long practiced the ideology of Songun, military first ideas. Songun entered into North Korean ideology in a big way after the founder of the state, Kim Il-sung, passed away, and his son, Kim Jong-il, took over. Because, you know, nothing says egalitarian communism and knocking down the class structure than having what is essentially a hereditary autocracy. And basically what the military first idea put forward is what it said on the tin, that in a universe in which North Korea had lost its primary military ally and sponsor and was surrounded by potential enemies, the absolute focus of the state would be on national defence and supporting the military. Every fibre of industry and labour would be dedicated to that particular goal. Factories would produce military goods and people would serve in the military on a lavish scale. In other words, the country would be run with all the budgetary restraint of a problem gambler, and the economic results were, well, they were disastrous as expected. Because someone in North Korean HR decided that a country of 26 million people should have a force structure which includes 1.28 million active troops, 600,000 reservists, and 5.7 million paramilitary members. Heck, according to Military Balance 2021, on paper, North Korea has a special forces command of 88,000 people. That means that not only do North Korean special forces outnumber their US equivalents, North Korea has more special forces troops than Australia has active duty members of the ADF. And if you think for a moment North Korea might not have the weapons to equip that massive force, well, wait just a second. Because on paper, despite being roughly the size of Mississippi, North Korea has an armoured force roughly the size of that of, well, Russia. According to Military Balance 2021, North Korea has something north of 3,500 active tanks, 2,500 APCs, 14,000 gun and missile artillery systems, 11,000 anti-aircraft guns, a small arsenal of nuclear warheads and ballistic missiles, and 71 submarines. Note the slide there does say MBTs next to the 3500 number. That is incorrect. Not all the tanks operated by North Korea are in fact main battle tanks, because they still literally operate, in some cases, the T-34. Now yes, a lot of that equipment probably does belong in a museum, but nonetheless, sustaining and training an army of that size and with that much equipment would be incredibly expensive. North Korea tries to get around this problem again with reference to Songun, military first. So it's pretty easy to find competing stats on what percentage of GDP the North Koreans spend on the military, but it's pretty easy to find people citing a number of around 25%, with some estimates going much, much higher. Now, I've said in other videos that it's easier for relatively wealthy countries to spend a greater percentage of GDP on defence than it is for poorer runs, because poorer countries need to spend more of their base GDP just allowing individuals to live, providing the very basics, shelter, food, the very basics of human survival. North Korea is not a wealthy country, and some of the methods that the government resorts to to raise funds include state-sponsored drug smuggling, hacking attacks, and weapon smuggling, as well as counterfeiting US currency. But even accounting for state-sponsored criminal activity, funding a military of that size using the North Korean economy probably isn't possible, so I'll leave it to the audience to guess as to what the training and sustainment standards of the North Korean military probably are. But if nothing else, that is a lot of troops and it is a lot of hardware, which perhaps helps explain how the next rumour we're going to talk about got started. Now, in August, news, in inverted commas, started swirling around the internet that North Korea was prepared to send 100,000 soldiers to aid Russia in its fight against Ukraine. 
YouTube videos and articles sprang up everywhere talking about the impact that the imminent arrival of 100,000 North Korean troops might have on the Ukraine war. The fact-checking site subsequently got involved pretty quickly and started beating down on individual Facebook posts or news articles, but those don't appear to have been the source. Instead, the center of gravity for this particular rumor seems to have been Russian State TV, where in August, commentator Igor Korchenko went on stage talking about how there were 100,000 North Korean volunteers ready and willing to assist Russia, and how their help should be accepted, because they had great knowledge of counter-battery techniques, and they had heavy caliber artillery systems, and they could provide an immense contribution to the Russian war effort, and as he described it, the war against Ukrainian fascism. Now, if you actually watch the clip, you can see that even at the time, the other commentators, they kind of needle Korchenko a little bit for saying this. They suggest, they sort of ask questions of, you know, is there really such a thing as a volunteer in North Korea, for example? Which is a fair point. And even Korotchenko himself isn't really talking about Russia accepting the assistance. He's saying it's the sovereign right, as he calls it, of, at that time, the DNR and LNR to sign an agreement with North Korea to allow Korean troops to participate. Long story short, there are no 100,000 Korean volunteers ready to fight for Russia, and there almost certainly never were. Indeed, the closest you get from a major official Russian source is a statement by the Deputy Prime Minister for Construction and Regional Development, commenting on the potential of bringing in North Korean construction workers to assist in the reconstruction of the Donbass. This sort of arrangement isn't for soldiers, it's a situation wherein North Korea sends its workers overseas to support other nations' building projects or economic activities. In exchange, the government of North Korea gets to keep 70-odd percent of the wages that those workers are paid. But that's a far cry from providing combat troops. So if North Korea wasn't going to provide combat troops, what were they going to provide to their Russian ally? Now, according to Russia and North Korea, the answer to that question is basically nothing. North Korea can't really supply Russia with military equipment without breaching resolutions restricting its export of weapons and other such articles. Resolutions that Russia itself signed on to and helped support. Although adhering to those resolutions is probably not high up Russia's priority list at the moment. The US, by contrast, is suggesting that Russia is attempting to buy potentially millions of rounds of artillery ammunition, shells and rockets, from the North Koreans in order to make up for their rapidly diminishing stockpiles. The Americans originally identified that they thought the Russians were shopping for such equipment, and recently they've made statements that such transfers are indeed happening. This sort of makes a degree of sense. There's a lot of caliber and system crossover between Russia and the DPRK, so it's almost certain that the North Koreans would have the sort of equipment lying around that Russia could make direct use of. And if these transfers are indeed taking place, there's a lot of candidates that could potentially be useful for Russia. 122mm rockets and artillery shells, 152mm artillery shells, 82 and 120mm mortar ammunition, those should all be relatively obvious. In a war in which the artillery has featured so frequently, so heavily, and has been so vital, and where ammunition consumption rates are stated to be so high, a resupply of common caliber artillery ammunition for Soviet-style systems from North Korea might be exactly what the Russian army ordered. Other commentators have noted that there is the possibility of moving large volumes of, say for example, small arm ammunition if Russia ever starts to run low on that, because again, the North Koreans and the Russians use a common set of Soviet family calibers. What I wouldn't expect to go would be North Korea's more valuable, quote, cutting edge weapon systems. They're ballistic missiles of any sort, short, intermediate, or long range. They have a relatively limited supply of them, and they're critical to the North Korean concept of deterrence. Instead, you're more likely to see transfers, for example, of rocket artillery ammunition. The North Koreans have a rocket artillery piece, which is essentially a derivative of the BM-21 Grad, one of the most common MLRS systems active in Ukraine. The ammunition for it could be useful to the Russians. But I have two caveats and points that I want to raise here. The first is, it's hard to prove that this is actually happening. Looking at the open source at the moment, there aren't exactly a plethora of images or videos of North Korean shells being piled up in Russian depots, or spent casings being discovered in overrun Russian positions, or rockets with North Korean maker stamps landing in Ukrainian positions. 
There are people in the open source community that love identifying new and interesting ammunition types when we catch them on video or in images in Ukraine. When we see Italian or Finnish or Romanian or Bulgarian ammunition in service or things with Chinese markings that have probably come by Albania, people pay attention. But there's no equivalent video evidence of the large-scale transfer of North Korean ammunition into Russian hands and its use in Ukraine yet. Although trust me, if there is any, it will get a follow-up video. The second point is a question over what sort of quality of ammunition might be provided. We've talked about how Russia has some very old, very deep stockpiles. The North Korean stockpiles are also deep, but they're arguably even older due to the relatively decrepit state of the North Korean economy and the economic limitations they faced in recent years. Ammunition, just like weapon systems, has a shelf life, and North Korea might be tempted if it transfers ammunition to send the older stuff first although even that might be enough to assure quality. Commentators who observe North Korean exercises note that there tend to be very low accuracy rates and very high failure rates during DPRK artillery exercises. Now, all armies expect some misses. They expect some shells to go wild, and they expect some shells to be duds. But based on what I've read about North Korean exercises, their rates are extraordinarily high, which can probably be expected when you try and run a million-man army on a couple of billion dollars a year. During the 2010 shelling of Yongpyong Island by North Korean artillery, four South Koreans died, two soldiers and two civilians, many more were wounded. So North Korean artillery clearly isn't harmless, but according to some estimates I've seen, as many as half of the shells and rockets fired didn't even make it to the island, falling far short. Now, when your accuracy or reliability is so bad that you miss an entire island, well, then you're not doing particularly well. Now, what's a little more difficult to do than mocking artillerymen for missing an island, which is admittedly a low blow, is isolating the driver for those failure rates. Did the crew just know how to operate their equipment badly? Did they aim incorrectly? Was the system itself at fault, the rocket launcher or the tube artillery pieces? Or was it the ammunition itself, the thing that would be shipped to Russia, that is faulty? My point there is that we should be careful before assuming that any ammunition that North Korea provides to Russia would ultimately be worthless. And even if it is relatively inaccurate or unreliable, it might help keep the guns firing and be suitable for some task. Providing saturation, preparatory fire over an area target might be possible using relatively old North Korean ammunition. If you have to fire two or three times as many shells to make sure you have enough reaching the target and going off, well, so be it. It's not a great solution, but it's still a solution. That sort of ammunition is ineffective if you're going to be using it for sort of precision point shooting, the, sort, the kinds of which we have seen a couple of times in Ukraine by both sides. But that's not all fire missions. And so many of us are going to keep our eyes peeled, because solid evidence of large-scale ammunition transfers from North Korea to Russia may not change in any significant way the path the war is taking, but it will have an impact and is worth monitoring. Even if you're the sort of person who happens to be inclined to believe the Russians and the North Koreans when they say these transfers aren't happening, I'd suggest a little bit of verification and monitoring couldn't hurt. Moving on then to another of the countries that voted with Russia at the General Assembly, and which has been fighting alongside them for many years at this point, the Syrian Arab Republic ruled by Bashar al-Assad. Now, just as with North Korea, political leadership in modern Syria has mostly been a family affair. Hafez al-Assad would rule as the 18th president of Syria between 1971 and the time of his death in 2000, when his son Bashar took over. Now, the country has faced many challenges and disruptions through its modern history, but its last decade in particular have been absolutely defined by the violence of civil uprising and insurgency leading to the Syrian civil war. That war has been in a state of armed struggle from 2012 onwards. It's been a multi-sided, multi-faceted struggle between various anti-government forces, including those that are backed by Western powers, Islamists, and the government and its allies. It is a brutal, long-running conflict which has caused immense human suffering and drawn in actors from across the region. And when I say this is a brutal war, I mean it. All wars are tragic, all wars cause suffering, but the scale of the damage and suffering caused by the Syrian civil war truly does cause it to stand out. Most of the civilian population would at the very least be internally displaced, and millions of Syrians would flee abroad as refugees. Meanwhile, in the country itself, as the war ground on and infrastructure was destroyed, the fighting forces themselves would devolve. 
Rebel forces would fight sometimes with homemade cannons using propane and home-built warheads, while government forces, as they began to run out of actual munitions, resorted to dropping so-called barrel bombs, a barrel filled with explosive out of the back of a cargo helicopter. As the regular army suffered attrition, desertion, and manpower problems, and also just massive casualties, it would be supplemented by irregular forces, technicals, and the employment of weapons of mass destruction, namely chemical agents. All of this through hard fighting that was often fought through the center of populated areas, cities and towns, block by block, room by room. And while the war was still very much ongoing and dynamic, it was clear by 2015 that Bashar al-Assad and his Syrian Arab army were not in particularly good shape, fighting mostly on the defensive and utterly exhausted. Now, I am aware that I am glossing over a significant conflict that probably deserves several of its own videos somewhere down the track, but the essence of it is this. Russia, by 2015, had long been a major arms supplier to the Assad government, but in 2015, it had accepted a request from the Assad government to directly militarily intervene in the conflict, first with airstrikes, then with cruise missile attacks, and then by deploying ground troops and a training mission and setting up fortified bases and a semi-permanent presence in Syria for a Russian expeditionary force. Now, Western observers very carefully watched that exercise in Russian intervention. They watched and noticed the fact that Russia did seem capable of pulling together enough sea lift and logistics to sustain an expeditionary force in Syria, to keep it fed with fuel and munitions, and to keep it active at a relatively high sortie rate. They watched very carefully the effectiveness and occasional lack of effectiveness by Russian cruise missiles, and their ability to coordinate strikes from very, very long distances. But for the purpose of this video, we're more concerned with the effects of intervention than what it taught Western forces. It was apparent by 2016 that bringing in Russian air power and bringing in Russian trainers and troops had given a new lease on life to the Syrian Arab army and allowed them to move over from the defensive to the offensive, often with the support of extensive aerial bombardment from their Russian allies. The introduction of the S-400 anti-aircraft system forced other powers that might be flying over Syria to be just that little bit more cautious, and the city of Aleppo, one of the largest in Syria that had fallen to the anti-government forces, would be retaken in 2016, largely due to Russian assistance. There would still be reverses and embarrassments in the future, but for the most part, the Syrian Arab army with its Russian allies was now on the offensive and improving its position in the civil war. Assad and Russia were now incredibly close. And in that political context, it's perhaps not surprising that some in Russia thought of reaching out to Syria for assistance once the war in Ukraine, you know, didn't end in the first week or two. Which leads to the obvious question, what does Assad have to assist with? After so many years of civil war and hard fighting, Military Balance 2021 assessed the Syrian Arab army as a force that combined a mixture of conventional forces, militias, auxiliaries, and special units. It had an estimated manpower of about 170,000 regulars and 100,000 paramilitaries supported by a 30-month conscription term. In terms of equipment, Syria started the civil war using largely Soviet equipment. But so much of it had been lost or damaged during the civil war that sources like Military Balance are actually reluctant to even provide estimates on how much that hardware might remain in service. And while it may not be particularly satisfying, I can't give you a better estimate. I don't know how many T-72s or T-90s are still active in Syria. All I know is that the sort of force that would roll out, for example, technicals and barrel bombs probably isn't drowning in modern serviceable equipment. At the very least, you can say for certain, while this might be an experienced army, it's not one designed or configured for expeditionary operations. But none of that has prevented Syria being at the very least politically active. For example, in 2014, they were one of the first countries to recognize the Russian claim to have annexed Crimea. And we've already covered how they voted against the condemnation of Russia's annexations in the General Assembly. But starting in roughly March, there were claims on Russian state television that Syrians were prepared to do a lot more to assist Russia than just political recognition or mutual support. Instead, there were claims that thousands of Syrians were volunteering to serve with Russia in Ukraine. The initially cited number was 16,000, and that was the number that most of the external media to Russia started to pick up on and run with. 
Vladimir Putin himself would then go on TV and be seen instructing Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu to facilitate the travel of those 16,000 volunteers. Putin would say that if you see there are people who want to, for, of their own accord, come here and help the people living in the Donbass, quote, then we need to give them what they want and help them get to the conflict zone. And of course, because it is the internet, again, the articles and videos would immediately come out talking about what the implication of 16,000 hardened urban warfare veterans from Syria would have on the war in Ukraine. And since we're now in November, I bet you think that I'm about to tell you about all the battles that those Syrian volunteers and mercenaries have fought in since they were first engaged in March. After all, 16,000 Syrians must have made a significant impact, right? Yeah, sorry, but there are not, there are not 16,000 Syrians fighting in Ukraine. This issue is a little more complicated and a little more confused than the North Korean issue, but here's a very rough timeline. In March, there were multiple reports coming out of large recruitment drives, that is, organizations in Syria looking for volunteers and the details of those who might be willing to go fight for a salary on Russia's side in the war in Ukraine. US CENTCOM, however, goes out and states they're not seeing any large movements of potential volunteers from Syria to Ukraine. Following that, The Guardian runs an article in late April suggesting that, as they call them, 20,000 Syrian mercenaries have been deployed to Ukraine, and there's some chatter sourced to an advisor in the Ukrainian government, Danilov, who suggests that there are some photographs of deceased Syrians, but those don't really make their way if they exist into the public domain. Those 20,000 fighters, those don't really materialize, and instead by May there are scattered claims that perhaps 530 fighters have made their way from Syria to fight on the Russian side in Ukraine. In July, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights suggests that approximately 2,000 individuals have probably been transferred, but no Syrians have actually been killed in action in the war so far. And then, come November, there's no compelling evidence on our side for any significant deployment. That's not to say there's no noise around it. There's certainly lots of evidence for the recruiting activities in Syria to take place. There are accounts, public statements by individual Syrian commanders offering up troops from their units or their organizations for potential service in Ukraine. And there are anecdotal reports from family members or whatnot who say that their family or their friends were offered contracts to go over to Russia to fight in Ukraine. And we have even specific numbers on payments they were being offered to do so. So it seems likely there was at least some attempt to recruit Syrian volunteers to go fight in Ukraine. The question is, how many of them got transferred? And of those that got transferred, how many of them have actually been used in combat? Because if you had 20,000 fighters, roughly, operating on a large scale in light infantry combat roles, you would expect a lot more press activity, and importantly, you'd expect a lot more photographic and visual evidence than what we have. Certainly the evidence that I've seen at least suggests Whatever recruitment activity took place, a much smaller deployment to Russia, if any of Syrian forces, and limited casualties, at least compared to that initially claimed 16,000 figure. Because, as I've said, it's kind of hard to just hide 20,000 frontline troops. And while it's certainly possible that both sides have decided to maintain OPSEC around the involvement of Syrians, that doesn't seem particularly likely. But I want to go further and ask the question, how much impact would Syrian troops, even veterans of the Syrian civil war, even have if deployed to Ukraine in significant numbers? The first point to suggest is, it would, hypothetically, it would matter who went, right? For example, my understanding is that one of the Syrian commanders who's come forward and basically said, my men might be interested in fighting for Russia in Ukraine, is Nabil Abdullah. Nabil Abdullah is a commander in the National Defense Forces of Syria, not the Syrian army. And the quality of NDF units across Syria is, shall we say, patchy. You can't really say that you're guaranteed to get quality recruits there. Units within that organization are highly localized and tend to depend on the Syrian army for logistics and fire support. They're not shock troopers, they're not sappers, they're not elite urban warfare operators, and their history, at least their known combat history in Syria, doesn't exactly cover them in glory. If you wanted comparatively effective volunteers and units, you'd want to look more towards those forces that the Russians themselves had been involved in training and operating alongside when they'd been in Syria, because the officers and what passes for NCOs would have a basic understanding of Russian, the Russian way of war, and would more easily integrate, at least compared to other Syrian paramilitary and military units. But for me, the biggest challenge is trying to understand why 
In an environment where partial mobilization has now been declared, it even makes sense to use Syrians, instead of just using mobilized Russians. For example, let's just say you're trying to do rear area security duty, hold down the Ukrainian population, uh, cover some checkpoints, and make sure that the trucks continue to flow without problems. Well, it's probably helpful if the troops in that situation can, you know, speak Russian. If you're going to be issuing instructions to Ukrainian civilians or interacting with the wider Russian army, it kind of helps to speak a language that allows you to, you know, be understood. And whatever complaints we have seen surfaced about the training standards for newly mobilized Russian personnel, it's usually relatively safe to assume that they at least speak Russian. Similarly, if you're talking about logistics duties, you just want people to drive trucks, dig trenches, Again, isn't it simply easier to use mobilized Russians or Russian civilians or civilian contractors to do that work, depending on how dangerous the situation is? Again, they will integrate more easily, there is less logistical challenges involved in their deployment, and they have the language and cultural setup to more easily integrate with the rest of your forces. Yes, you could presumably use Syrian troops to prepare defensive positions, for example, but under guidance, Russian mobilized personnel can probably do the same thing. And then when you talk, move from rear area duties to talking about assault duties, again, the question is, how effective would Syrian troops be, really? The fighting in Ukraine offers a completely different terrain setting, climactic setting, and military setting than the fighting in Syria did. The Ukrainians have considerably more artillery, more accurate artillery, drones, and high-tech weapons than the opposition forces in Syria ever did. Ukraine is a country of great wide-sweeping plains, and a country that is about to, well, is currently in the grips of mud season, and is soon going to be in the deep freeze of winter. This is not a place that I would expect Syrian troops to readily acclimatize to. So my core point here is, it would take a very large Syrian contingent and an awful lot of retraining and logistical effort to convert them into a significant amount of combat power, and that even if they're veterans, it might be quicker and easier to mobilize Russians and put them through training in order to produce those same military effects. And in any case, I think Syrian contributions to the war in Ukraine are going to be limited by the fact that there is still a war on in Syria. Yes, one with less border movements and advances and retreats than in previous years, but it's still very much an ongoing concern and the Syrian government probably needs many of its skilled fighters at home. When Russia intervened, the Assad government was in deep trouble. It required Russian military support in order to stabilize and improve the situation. Now many of those Russian units are long gone, some very long gone and some departing more recently. In that context, you have to wonder how keen the Syrian government will be for some of its best troops to go overseas to fight in a war from which they might never return. But having talked now about several countries and an organization that probably haven't contributed in a material sense or haven't been proven to contribute in a material sense the same way the media has suggested they have, let's talk about a country that has undeniably had a real and ongoing impact. Let's talk about the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, given how long my videos tend to run, I'm actually going to spare you the primer on Russo-Persian slash Russo-Iranian relationships going back many, many centuries, and focus instead on the relations that Russia and before it the Soviet Union have had with the Islamic Republic, that is, the country, the government that came into being after the Islamic Revolution during the Cold War. Now, the USSR, as I recall, was one of the first, in fact, I believe it was the first state to recognize the Islamic Republic as the legitimate government of Iran. But as you might expect, there were a few ideological and diplomatic teething issues between a government which embraced state atheism and a theocratic Islamic Republic led by religious figures. As a result, throughout the Cold War, Soviet-Iranian relations sort of oscillated. The Soviet Union was a weapons supplier to Iran, but it was also associated with Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq War, for example. The Soviet Union didn't want to see Saddam Hussein toppled. They did not want to see the Islamic Republic support potential uprisings or insurgencies throughout Central Asia, and so they provided, towards the end of the Iran-Iraq War, a tremendous amount of military support to Saddam Hussein's government. As you can imagine, allowing the Iraqis to snatch the end they got from the jaws of defeat didn't exactly endear Moscow to Tehran. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, relations did begin to steadily improve. In recent years, you've seen deepening ties economically and militarily between Russia and Tehran, and also you've seen both powers come up on the same side in the Syrian civil war, both being major backers of Bashar al-Assad's government. 
Now, I acknowledge that all of that is a gross oversimplification. It glosses over the Russian engagement with the Iranian nuclear program and international measures designed to halt it. It glosses over the Medvedev years and a number of other nuances in their relationship. But the key is that in the here and now, alignment between Russia and Iran is relatively close. Close enough, in fact, that it seems like Iran is willing to supply Russia with the weapons it needs to continue fighting its war in Ukraine. And when we talk about the weapon systems that Iran has or the quality of the Iranian military, I just want to remind everyone out there that Iran doesn't have one military. It has the regular army, navy, air force, and then sitting alongside it, it has the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, a parallel military structure with a different reporting line, a different culture, a different rank and promotion structure, and a responsibility that focuses far more on internal security and the security of the regime than external defense, although it does that as well. Overall, the military has about 610,000 actives, of whom 190,000 roughly are in the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, according to Military Balance 2021. They've got about 1,500 plus MBTs, 3,700 tube and rocket artillery systems, and a variety of homegrown drones and ballistic missile systems. Plus, this is a nation which actually has a whole bunch of legacy, and I mean legacy, legacy US hardware in service. Before the Islamic Revolution, the Shah of Iran was a major ally of the West, and particularly of the United States. That means that this is one of those countries that pretty much got what it wanted in terms of US military hardware when it decided to go shopping. And the Shah did like spending money on military equipment. If, for example, you're a fan of the Top Gun films and you'd like to see an F-14 Tomcat flying in active service, you won't be able to find one in the United States. They've all been retired. The type was classed as generally too expensive to maintain and operate and was replaced by other cheaper types. But Iran still has its F-14 fleet and a small proportion of that is believed to still be in flying condition many, 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 many years after the Islamic Revolution. But as interesting as it would be for military hardware watchers around the world, Iran isn't exactly supplying the Russians with F-14 Tomcats. Instead, the weapons of focus here is that second last point, the drones and potentially ballistic missiles. Iran's vast array of homegrown, relatively cheap, relatively simple, domestically manufactured missile and drone systems. The kind of weapons that make sense if you're a country that faces constant embargoes and is committed to fighting an asymmetric battle for regional influence against much stronger and much richer powers. Iran has, for example, been accused of using proxy forces to deploy drones to attack infrastructure targets in Saudi Arabia. Particularly, oil refineries are quite popular targets for attack. The theory here is obvious. You take a relatively cheap drone system, you attack a target which produces millions or potentially billions of dollars worth of economic value over a protracted period of time, and in order to defend it, you force your opponent to use their expensive F-15 fighters, their AMRAAM air-to-air missiles, or to fire their expensive Patriot interceptors purchased from the United States. It's an asymmetric brand of industrial warfare done on the cheap. Now, at the time of recording, Iran's foreign minister has only acknowledged that Iran gave Russia, quote, a small number of drones, end quote, before the war began, specifically months before the February 24th invasion. And that's why certain Iranian drone systems are being shown in Russian service. Until that statement was made, most Iranian officials were claiming that Western assertions that Iran was supplying many, many, many drones to Russia were totally unfounded. As for the scale of those Western claims, the Ukrainians have said something they believe, that 1,700 drones have been supplied to the Russians so far, and the Russians are asking for about 2,400 in total. In relation to this particular he said, she said, I'll submit the following. Iranian weapons in Ukraine are a very, very real, visually confirmed phenomenon. The appearance of Ukrainian Shahed-type drones really increased in frequency, relatively recently, and they have been deployed in significant numbers. We've got videos of them crashed next to Ukrainian positions. We've got videos of them being launched from trucks. We have videos of them impacting targets in Ukraine. And we have a video of Zelensky standing next to one of the damn things. So the weapon systems are very clearly in Ukraine. The question then becomes, how many of them and when did they arrive? To that, I would suggest this. If the Russians had large numbers of these things early in the war, the question is, why would they have chosen not to employ them? 
If you're looking at a relatively cheap, relatively easy to replace weapon system, and you're engaging the enemy integrated air defense system, well then why not deploy it in order to make a hole or increase the odds of your more complicated, more deadly systems successfully making it behind enemy lines and striking their targets? And on the point of quantity, all I would say is the Iranian statement they supplied a small number, well, that's not a particular number, so I can't rebut it. All I know is that the Russians have been launching a significant number of evidence drone strikes over the past few weeks, and they don't show any sign so far of letting up. Ukrainian Shorad anti-aircraft crews talk about engaging drones regularly with systems like Gepard. We have videos of systems even like Book and S-300 having to engage relatively small incoming drones. Not always Shahed, sometimes larger ones as well, but we do have video evidence of those systems being in use. And so I'd suggest that the evidence that we have available is most consistent with the idea that Russia received a large supply of Ukrainian drones after the war had begun. That's consistent with them only being used in large numbers recently. A small number received before the war is hypothetically possible, depending on how you strain the meaning of small, but it would mean that they would have had to sit on that number of drones until this particular point, and then use them en masse without any regard to resupply. I find that less likely personally, but your mileage may vary. The reason I choose to focus on these weapons more than the supposed North Korean volunteers or the Syrian mercenaries or volunteers, whatever you want to call them, is that these give the Russians a very valuable capability. They answer a gap in the Russian arsenal. The Russians appear to have been short of precision guided munitions. They use a lot of dumb bombs, for example, when smart munitions would be better. They risk expensive platforms striking targets and they lose car 52s. They lose aircraft striking those targets. At the same time, their greatest challenge in that respect is the Ukrainian integrated air defense system, which is still overwhelmingly reliant on its supply of Soviet era surface to air missiles. The Ukrainians had thousands, it is reported, of the S-300 missiles at the start of this war, so running them out of it is a difficult proposition for the Russians. They'll probably run out of aircraft long before the Ukrainians run out of interceptor missiles. Shahed and weapons like that help partly address that mismatch. These systems can be countered, they can be defended against, but they require positioning air defense around all potential targets power plants, critical infrastructure, government buildings, anything that might get hit by these sort of drone attacks, and they can be difficult to counter cheaply. A burst of Gepard cannon fire might be a cost-effective counter if a Gepard can get its guns on targets. But if you have to fire a book missile at one of these things, well, you're not winning that particular economic exchange. $20,000 drone against a limited supply of very capable anti-aircraft missiles, Russia wins that exchange every time. And just as Shahed, even with its relatively limited capabilities, but as a cheap and cheerful drone filling part of the gap in the Russian PGM arsenal, you have to wonder whether or not Iranian ballistic missiles might be introduced to Russia to compensate for the depletion of, for example, Iskander arsenals. It's reported that Russia has used a majority of its very capable, very dangerous Iskander missiles, and that it may have difficulty replacing them at the rate that it would want to expend them both because of limited production capacity just in general, and also the use of foreign components in their construction. The introduction of Iranian missiles, which we don't have any visual evidence of yet, would support the Russians in that regard. So in terms of assessing the impact of Iranian weapon systems going to Russia, and the potential impact of what they may ship next, well, here's what we know so far. The Ukrainians, as I said, claim that about 1,750 drones have been supplied so far, with Russia requesting about 2,400. Again, that's according to the Ukrainians. Western sources claim that Iranian supplies may indeed ramp up and that supplies may increase over time. I would suggest that it is entirely possible it's within Iranian capabilities to increase drone supplies, even with the Israelis occasionally practicing their habit of bombing Iranian drone factories. In Syria, it must be said. Then beyond just the issue of cheap and cheerful drones, Western governments are also claiming that Iran is actively considering, planning, or undertaking the transfer of surface-to-surface -surface missiles. As I said, this would be really useful to Russia. It helps fill a little bit of a void in the arsenal that might be left by something like Iskander. Now, looking at these Iranian systems, most of them are not as capable as the Russian system that they are meant to be augmenting or replacing. The CEP figures just aren't there. But even if these weapon systems aren't a one-to-one -one replacement for the Russian systems that they're filling in for, they're still an additional capability, they're still a critical piece of resupply that Russia would benefit from. 
To me, the complicating factor in the extent to which Iran can run up its weapon supplies to Russia comes down to Iran's own situation. You may have noticed that tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia are pretty high right now, with Saudi Arabia looking to the United States to potentially defend it against Iranian attacks, and rumours of Iranian military action being pretty omnipresent in parts of Western media. Given that Iran doesn't exactly operate in what you would call a friendly neighbourhood, it's difficult to imagine them significantly depleting their weapon stores in order to resupply Russia. They've got a lot of drones, they've got a lot of missiles, they can probably afford to part with some of them in exchange for Russian support, but there's going to be a limit. And I suspect that assessing that limit, both in terms of will and material capability, is probably going to be a priority for an awful lot of intelligence agencies out there. So in conclusion, Russia's allies, as at today, have mostly not provided the same level of support and assistance to Russia that Ukraine has been receiving from its allies and friends. To an extent that makes sense because the industrial and military capabilities of Ukraine's friends and allies are many times greater than those states that are very closely aligned with Russia, at least the ones we've talked about today. Most of those nations face very significant limitations on their ability to support Russia based on their own circumstances. The CSTO is frayed, Armenia is angry at the entire organisation, and most CSTO nations want nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. Syria is still engaged in a civil war and has limited economic and military resources. The DPRK is... Well, it's the DPRK, and Iran is currently engaged in a tense standoff with Saudi Arabia in a potentially explosive region. In that context, it's hard to imagine any of those allies handing over a significant proportion of their available assets to assist the Russians. But there are two obvious windows that remain for those allies to make at least some difference to Russia's performance on the battlefield in Ukraine. The first is the resupply of Soviet-caliber ammo from the DPRK, which we have heard asserted from Western sources, is happening on at least some scale. And secondly, it's the supply of Iranian drones and missiles. We've seen the drones, we've seen the impact that they have. They're not the deadliest things, they're not the most dangerous things, but a lot of them can be supplied and they can overwhelm or at least tax the resources of an opposing air defense system. The introduction of short-range ballistic missiles as well would also help augment Russian supply issues on systems like Iskander that they have been depleting since the start of the war. None of this is likely to swing the war as a whole. The numbers that we're talking about are significant, but nowhere near dramatic enough that you would expect them to change the overall trend of material input. They're not collectively an answer to the provision by the West of tanks or HIMARS or HARM or hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of artillery rounds, including guided ammunition, something the North Koreans will not be able to supply in quantity. But they do answer particular and potentially acute Russian requirements. Drones, missiles, ammunition, these are things that Russia can put to use far more readily than, for example, 10,000 Syrian volunteers. And so I think while it is perfectly fine to acknowledge the limitation of Russia's allies and their willingness and ability to support, it would be wrong to ignore them and the impact that they will have entirely. Okay, channel update to close out, and I hope you all enjoyed today's video. I've been looking forward to a chance to zoom out on the crisis a little bit and look at Russia's allies and its diplomatic situation, and it was great to finally have a chance to do so. Special thanks as I'm closing out to those who have been assisting me in preparing these videos, particularly sound and subtitles. I always call them out, but they deserve to be called out. Uh, in particular, my sound guy has put up with my terrible sound quality as I continue to travel around Australia, and my subtitler is very, very patient, but also quick on the turnaround. Most of you know that I don't script these videos. There is no script. I work through the slides and try and do it in as close to one take as possible, which makes life really hard if you're trying to do subtitles for these videos because there's no script to use as your basis. So thank you again. For those of you that are members of the Patreon, there should be two votes coming up this week. One on upcoming topics, mostly in terms of what gets priority, not saying that any of the ones that are put up for vote won't be produced. And secondly, on what charities we might want to support on behalf of the channel in the future. So far as the war in Ukraine goes, obviously I'm watching Kherson and a number of other sections of the front very, very closely. There's a lot to discuss in terms of mud season, winter, and its potential implications. But for the moment, I don't think a video on those topics is appropriate yet. There's not quite enough information. So if nothing else dramatic changes in the next week, expect a video on a particular system category next week. Finally, a thank you to all of you who are supporting the gaming channel off to the side. I know I'm not producing as much content there at the moment just because I have a very limited amount of time, and this channel obviously takes precedence, but the support there has been amazing and I genuinely appreciate it. 
Thank you all very much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week.